his colleagues came down on top of him. Oh, so bad. Because he was using the pancreatic enzymes, and they, and his colleagues are saying, oh, it can't be that simple. It can't be that easy. And so they kind of beat him up for it. The same thing Beard got. Beard well, got then, beat up by his colleagues, even though his work was proven in 40 clinics in England. If your continuing search for answers has led you nowhere, you will find the truth here on the Forbidden Doctor Podcast. Seek the truth with your hosts, Dr. Jack and Mary Stockwell. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Jack. And Mary. And we are here with a very important podcast, not just because of its content, because it is podcast 100. 100. We've done a century of these. We've done this weekly for (laughs) almost two years. Yeah, this is really cool. And this podcast is called The Conquest of Cancer and the Intelligence of Your Body. And we, we thought it was fitting to end with this podcast because we have talked so much about cancer for the last almost two years now. And we're going to take a two-week break. Yes, we are. We're not going to be back for a couple of weeks. We're going to spend time with our family. And in January, we will start with 101. And so it, we, I guarantee it'll knock your socks off. Yeah, we're excited about it. So we're, we're going to be talking about uh, kind of a continuation of the last podcast we did and a cancer cure that was discovered 130 years ago. Um, very brave, very courageous doctors have used this enzyme therapy successfully for cancer for several times over the last century. And unfortunately, these advances have been prosecuted and covered up by the FDA and the monolithic cancer industry. And you are seeing uh, pictures here. Of, uh, Dr. of a hero. Of, of th- yeah, two heroes. Yeah. Dr. Beard, the one on the far left there, his enzyme treatment of cancer uh, that was pretty well proven over several decades in England, and it got a smattering here in this country. And then Dr. N- N- Gonzalez and his concepts of the trophoblast and the origins of cancer. Uh, it's kind of a technical book, but you can get through it. And this podcast will be a little bit technical also, but it's it's going to be so good. Yes explaining what Dr. Gonzalez explained so well. And then a great announcement. We've announced this a time or two. We're going to do it again. Our enzyme product. Yay! And you don't even have to put the name in quotes anymore. Yeah. Just Long Life Energy Enzymes. They like us now. And reviews are finally showing up. We have four customer reviews so far. Ah, good. So please leave us a review if you like the product. We will make it worth your time if you do. And... um, We're just super excited. It took Mm -hmm. forever to get it on here. There's no competition for this on Amazon. There is no product like this on Amazon. Well, there's all kinds of enzyme products out there, but nothing like this. Yeah, that was part of the problem with not... You had to type it in quotes because there's no other... The algorithms with with Amazon, you yeah. have to have some kind of comp- competition. Yeah. And there's nothing yep. with this. There's no, no product like this in the world, actually. Then we want to remind you to uh, personalize supplement protocol at no charge to you. Just go to our website, ForbiddenDoctor.com, take the free symptom survey. In fact, I've got eight of them right now that I need to answer. (laughs) You do such a good job on these. Well, in response to the survey answers, we'll send you a personalized supplement protocol. You You can use it or you can not use it. It doesn't matter. It didn't cost you anything. And as uh, in return, we will give you a username and a password to go further into the website. Then you go back to the website, sign in. You'll see your very own supplement protocol sitting there waiting for you. The Jack and our nutritionists have worked so hard yes. on. I have, too, a little bit on them, but I'm mostly working on the podcast. Yes, you now. are, yeah. and you've done a marvelous and job. And you are working very hard doing your national radio Every show. Every Tuesday morning, 7 to 8 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, 8 o'clock on the East Coast, Doug Steffen's Good Day Show. It's live. You just go to RadioAmerica.com. Now, you can also find the radio stations that it's carried live on, his, his show, and there may be one in your area. If there isn't, just listen to it on their computer, yeah. RadioAmerica.com. Jack is the alternative medical... Yeah, he has a cardiologist for uh-huh. the standard the party alternative, line, alternative and then he health. has me for the other view. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then we are giving out regular discounts and special coupons for our products and services. All you need to do to get onto that list, if you haven't already, is you just text the word HEALTHY to 41411. And remember, you can always call us, text us, or email us with questions. All our contact information is on the last slide of the webinar every week. All right. 
And now back to our weekly feature. Yes, this is, this is exciting. Th these are forbidden secrets they don't want you to know. These are the secret things they keep from you, the dumb things they tell you, and the really important things they know nothing about. Today, I am going to show you a video that was I captured off of Fox News. And remember, Alan Thicke just died a few weeks ago. Of a, Suddenly, he suddenly died of a heart attack. And so Fox News brought in their resident cardi you know cardiac specialist he's a cardi cardiologist i'll show you his credentials in a minute and the, what he says is great for crisis care but it's appalling that we are forbidden to know how to prevent how this could have been avoided in the first how place how this could have been avoided yep. and this is the saddest thing ever so i'm just going to play it now Continuing our coverage of the sudden death of actor Alan Thicke, you just heard from someone who witnessed this medical emergency that happened yesterday around this time. Uh, we're bringing in now practicing cardiologist Dr. Kevin Campbell, a frequent guest of our program. And Dr. Campbell, I couldn't think of anybody better to talk to about this. I mean, we talk often, but I mean, what, uh, what a sudden, devastating thing to have happen. And you heard the description by Darren, who works at the rank, who said Alan Thicke was feeling, he was feeling poorly. They had to call 911. But he was talking, and he was explaining how he was feeling, and he gave a thumbs up going into the ambulance as they wheeled him out. He was sitting up. You know, he wasn't expecting to get the news that he passed away. So I'm just curious, as a cardiologist, is that, is that typical? You know, it's not uncommon for people to have chest pain or angina or angina where they have chest pain, shortness of breath, numbness, and the nausea that he experienced because what that is is a blockage in an artery to the heart that's beginning to close. And then what happens is it completely closes and you have this heart attack that probably occurred with Mr. Thick while he was in the ambulance. And, you know, associated with that is a sudden death heart rhythm called ventricular fibrillation. And I'm, unfortunately, I'm guessing that's what happened. And we don't know exactly all the specifics at this time, but w just so that our viewers know, I think this is where we're kind of getting to the, you know, how, how do we take this story and do some good? Meaning, we know it's the holiday season. We love it that we're, we're all happy during this time. It also can be a really stressful time. And we can find ourselves doing some unusual things, unusual activities. And so I'm just wondering if, if there's any warning signs of a catastrophic event like that coming on. There are. So if you experience chest pain with exertion, if you get shortness of breath with exertion, maybe you get an atypical pain in your, your jaw, maybe you get uh, pain down your arm, all of these can represent heart pain. And in women, sometimes the symptoms are even more vague. It could be nausea, feeling of dread. You have to know your risk and interpret those symptoms within, you know, what is your risk for heart disease. One of the interesting things that Darren just told us, too, is that, you know, in maybe another situation, you might think that this guy would be totally fine, that maybe he wouldn't go off into the ambulance. You know, if we're at a dinner table and someone starts feeling well, but says, you know, don't, no, I don't need the ambulance. I just, you know, I'm feeling a little bit off. How do you know when it's a real emergency? You know, I think anytime you're a patient who has any risk factors for heart disease and you have something like Mr. Thick had with chest pain and nausea, you need to call 911 immediately. It's better to be evaluated and find out that everything's okay than not because, you know, sudden cardiac death kills 450,000 Americans every single year, the number one cause of death in the United States today. I think we also thank Dr. Campbell because of the amazing things we can do in the ER and obviously in the medical field that Oh, well, people don't die of heart attacks so suddenly. Like, There's so many things we can do to save them. Um, but it seems like what you're saying in some cases is just not possible. You know, we have made great advances in medicine to where if we can get that patient to the hospital fast enough and I can get him into a cardiac cath lab and open that artery with a balloon and a stent, we can stop that heart attack in its tracks. But in this case, as he was being transported, I think probably what happened is he had a lethal heart rhythm called ventricular fibrillation, and we weren't able to get him to the cath lab to fix that blocked artery. What if one of our viewers is listening and thinking, well, I don't think I have a history of heart disease. You know, I don't think my family does. I don't think I do. I haven't been to the doctors in a while. I'm just thinking about the folks that might be listening to you right now. So if you have some of those questions, how do you find answers, number one? And if you could, Dr. Campbell, just review for us, you know, what would be for you as someone that practices on a regular basis the number one warning flag? You know, for me, I think that you need to know the risk factors. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, 
prior history of heart disease, family history of heart disease, obesity. If you have those risk factors, you may need to talk to your doctor and ask those questions. Am I at risk? Also, if you have any kind of symptoms such as chest pain, shortness of breath on exertion, any type of exertional pain, you need to see a doctor because I want everybody to be safe over this holiday season. Oh, it's such a good reminder. You know, we just want to be reminded. What we Get some clarity, be reminded, and act on that information if it does come up. Dr. Campbell, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Your expertise means a lot to us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there you heard the standard of care for emergency procedures that probably saves a lot of lives, those who actually make it to and get in a the cardiac, cardiac lab. lab and get a balloon put in them. Yeah, because that'll open up that blockage. But they don't talk about collateralization. They don't talk about the fact that uh, the doctor says, boy, we got you just in time, but you had a 90% block in the radio Widowmaker, and you're wondering if it was 90% block, why am I alive? Well, it's that, but we talk about that in the real cause of heart attack. Yeah, this, this, this is, I mean, seriously, this is all they offer. They don't offer, I mean, the forbidden information you need to know about the heart. These people are scared. You can see she's scared when she talks about this. The, the Fox News host is scared. He offered nothing. So this is a perfect... He offered nothing in the sense of preventing these things taking place or explaining why ventricular fibrillation happens. Or he, if you He says a lot what to do if you're lucky enough to make it yeah, to the Yeah, and he talks way. about the, the cholesterol, which is uh, two podcasts ago we, we put yeah, in there's, here, there's number no 98. There's no relationship Col between heart no, attacks and No, and, and then he talks about as you've had a previous... Boy, if you've had a previous heart attack, you should... I mean, that's the forbidden information we're trying to get out there. Yeah, There's so This is what so you should be much. doing now this is what if you should be doing. a heart attack. So this is a perfect example of our country no longer having healers anymore. We just don't have health care. All we have is crisis care, and that is all we're legally ever able to talk about is crisis care because this cardiologist had no idea how to heal or prevent a heart attack. This is this is forbidden information. He didn't talk about eating hard or organs or eating eggs or you know the perfect food. He didn't talk about eating protein and saturated fat and of course nothing about supplementing with whole food organ meat, protein, calcium food, yep. rutin or even the wonderful forbidden medicine from Brazil we talk about in podcast number 89, LBJ should have had this, not an EKG, and number 98, cholesterol is king. Low cholesterol will kill you. And number 19, the real cause of heart attacks. And that has a blog associated with it. I also wanted to go over a couple of the slides, which I had to stop and take pictures of. This guy um, is a practicing cardiologist. He's assistant professor of medicine in North Carolina. Um, he wrote a book on women and cardiovascular disease. And he specializes in treatment of heart rhythm disorders. Does he give them cataplex F? Well, you'd think he would know something with those kinds of credentials, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah, and but then... But no, he's not prescribing cataplex F. Uh, the CDC, the scary things that I had to kind of take pictures of is the CDC, roughly one in four U.S. deaths is the result of heart disease. My goodness, don't you think we should have this forbidden information everywhere? The CDC also says 11% of all adults in the United States suffer from heart disease. And, the, and heart disease claims more lives than all forms of cancer combined. Yes. Now, this is a tragedy. It's, it's, in my opinion, almost criminal that we are not allowed to get out the forbidden information to save these people. Um, here's another slide that I decided to take pictures of. Sudden cardiac death is responsible for half of all heart disease deaths. Um, that's the kind that Alan Thicke had. Um, about 47% of heart disease deaths occur outside the hospital, suggesting those suffering, suffering from symptoms are unaware. Mm -hmm. So they need to come in and get a heart sound recorder test, yeah. which we're giving away free in our office. And there's many of them all over the country. Yes. Um, and then this on the bottom left slide, Dr. Campbell the treatment for ventricular fibrillation is electric shock. And I'm sorry, it's just barbaric that he doesn't know about Cataplex B. Cataplex F, Cardio Plus, Cardiotrophin, the things that the rebuild oils, the heart. The good yes, fat. The good oils, the, the uh, omega-3s. Yeah, and, and what does he offer? Electric shock. Shock it. Yeah, and then the this is it. Learn CPR and ensure that these... I, you know, you see these defibrillation devices all over public buildings now on the wall, just like they used to have 
fire extinguishers all over the place. Mm-hmm. Now they have these defib kits. They're called uh, afibrillation electro. I don't. I don't know what that stands for. AEDSs are placed in public spaces. That's it. That's all he offers. Unbelievable on a national, international, pretty much show. Um, we refer you back to podcast number nineteen, the real cause of heart attacks. I will have this handout available at the end of the podcast. Okay. What causes heart attacks by Dr. Thomas Cowan? All right. We want to also always. Talk about our disclaimer to keep yes. us safe so we can keep getting this forbidden information yes. out just there. Just so you understand, what we're saying is for information purposes and educational purposes only. This only. is not intended as a treatment. It's not intended to be a diversion away from the current system of disease management. It is our intention to offer a rational and very effective approach to aiding your body and its ability to rebuild and heal. If you're having a real crisis... Turn off this podcast <laughs> and go to the ER as soon as possible. As Dr. Campbell said. Yes. But if you listen to um, podcast number 19, we'll, it tells you what to do so you don't get in a real crisis. So let's, what we want to do is go through some uh, success stories r- relative to Dr. Beard because Dr. Beard's success was so well known 100 years ago that there were clinics opening all up throughout the United Kingdom. Yeah. That... Uh, I think there was like 40 clinics alone in just in England. And last week we ended with a little success story about the mice that were in, had tons of tumors in them, and he injected an extract of trypsin into two mice growing the cancers, and the tumors completely regressed. Yes. And he used the therapy of injecting enzymes. D- injecting the pancreatic enzyme directly into the tumor right. itself. They thought that was the right way to go back then. But it still worked. It just isn't as good as taking them orally. When you research this stuff, one of the earliest records you're going to come across was in November of 1906 in the medical record by a New York physician, Clarence Rice. And we briefly mentioned this last time, the treatment of cancer of the larynx by subcutaneous injection of pancreatic extract. And it had a a subtitle, A Case of Growth, Supposed to be carcinoma cured, just using cured. trypsin. Yeah, just I mean, remarkable cure, yeah. as they called it. And that's there in the record. It can be read. A month later, in December of 1906, another New York physician, Margaret Cleves, described two patients in the medical record. There was a woman who had a recurrent large tumor of the tongue that stabilized on the enzyme treatment. And, it, and at the time of the publication, the patient hadn't been on the therapy very long, but seemed to be improving substantially. And then there was a second case, a man with a large inoperable rectal carcinoma experiencing tumor necrosis. It was starting, you know, and tumor um, liquefaction. liquefaction. And finally, it's sloughing off with the trypsin injections. And that's what they, when they were using Dr. Beard's therapy, they would inject trypsin, a very powerful protein digesting enzyme directly into the tumor itself. Yeah, it stopped it from eating into healthy tissue with no side effects. And then, and then they would inject it with chymotrypsin. And that would liquefy. And that would liquefy the tumor, and the body would just pass it off. Yeah. And it, and it was so effective that in one particular case, and it's in uh, Dr. Beard's book, The Enzyme Therapy for Cancer, uh, that he published, I think, 1906, if I remember right. He talks about this uh, lieutenant in the English Navy that had a large tumor growing outside of his body, and he they used his... his uh, method, and it was so effective in killing and liquefying that tumor that the blood supply wasn't taken care of properly with that tumor, and he ended up bleeding to death oh. because the tumor just turned into mush, passed away, and then here's all this arterial stuff Jeez. that the tumor had built to give itself food and life, and he ended up bleeding <laughs> to death because they couldn't stop the hemorrhage once the tumor dissolved. That well, was the, rare, but that, yeah. that was in the record. The Journal of American Medical Association and the British Medical Journal describes apparent cures of patients diagnosed with head and neck, inoperable uterine, colorectal, and metastatic breast cancer cures. Yeah. That's in two of those yes. incredible journals. So um, Dr. Beard, uh, it's so sad what happened to him. Dr. Gonzalez describes Dr. Beard's incredible, you know, rise to glory and and rise to success with the miserable 
ending of his life where he was completely discounted. And I'm going to read to you just one paragraph. It's really good. He says, Though the rejection of something new in the scientific research community hardly seems surprising, it is, of course, the historical norm, I find the ultimate indifference towards and contempt for Dr. Beard evident in his contemporary academic colleagues most unfortunate. Beard was, after all, an impeccably trained scientist, a professor at an eminent European university whose embryological findings are still accepted in the texts of our day. He carefully documented his laboratory and clinical results that he published in the conventional medical literature, but it seems to have made no difference at all. Yeah, no difference at all. You know, that reminds me of that Schopenhauer quote, and I'm going to say this wrong, but it's something like this, that when when science is faced with some new fact, at first it's rejected, Mm -hmm. then it's ridiculed, then it's accepted as scientific fact. Yeah, as norm. Yeah, I as mean, the norm. You didn't know yeah, that? Right. I think it's Schopenhauer that said that. And that's, you know, it, it's another one of these sad cases because sometimes the simplest of answers, you know. But in, this hasn't been accepted. No, no, it hasn't. No, H.G. Uh, Wells, War of the Worlds. And the Martians come here and they invade the earth and they're about ready to totally destroy the earth. And what is it that finally kills the Martians? I don't know. The smallest of God's creations. Oh, the back the bacteria. I was going to say it was the, that song. What's that song from Mars Attacks? Oh yeah, uh, uh, Slim Whitman. Slim Whitman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Slim Whitman song there. Yeah, it's 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 uh, H. G. Wells. I mean, back in a hundred years ago when that book was published. I mean, they they understood this bacterial thing, and it was, a, and I thought that was so poetic for him to say that. The smallest of God's creations finally did the Martians in. Well, sometimes some the, the, the most cycle of life horrible things can be solved by the simplest of of answers. So let's go on here with how Doctor Beard's work was because well, it, it got pushed aside and buried because of the, Madame Curie, the the two time Lor- Nobel laureate, Nobel laureate. No, no, yeah, she Nobel won two laureate. Nobel prizes. <laughs> See, I won't win one of those. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> she won two Nobel prizes, and she was the darling of the science community. And we've talked about this in other podcasts, yeah, uh, the cancer ones. We talked about in the last one, where she just, you know, here we have X rays; they're completely non toxic. They're 100% effective for cancer. And, uh, and I loved what you pointed out last time, that even her records in her, her laboratory this day is walled off because you can't well, go you have in to go in a separate room with a hazmat, hazmat suit Because on. it's radioactive. To this day, it's radioactive. To look at her books. And she died, of course, of aplastic anemia, of radiation poisoning, as well as most of her crew died of the same thing. And so they, they found out that wasn't so effective, and so they tried to control that. And these still back in the days when they would just cut the cancer out and hit it with X-ray before chemotherapy showed up. Yeah. And so... Well, but they didn't, you know, Ben's, Beard's, Dr. Beard's enzyme thesis and therapies didn't disappear completely. Periodically, it appeared again. During the 1920s and 30s, a St. Louis physician, Dr. F.L. Morse, reported that he had successfully treated a number of advanced cancer patients with injectable pancreatic enzymes. So it appeared here and there, and then... Dr. Selig, who was, uh, it was published in the uh, St. Louis Medical Society, I will quote, uh, While I heartily agree with Dr. Allen when he strikes the note of encouragement, I recoil at the idea of witlessly spreading the hope of a cancer cure, which is implicit in the remarks of Dr. Morse this evening. His colleagues came down on top of him. Oh, so bad. Because he was using the pancreatic enzymes, and they and his colleagues are saying, oh, it can't be that simple. It can't be that easy. And so they kind of beat him up for it. The same thing Beard got. Beard well, got then, beat up by his colleagues, even though his work was proven in 40 clinics in England. Then in 1960s, of Dr. Frank Shively, a Dayton, Ohio surgeon, he, he injected um, pancreatic enzymes in his treatment protocols and in a self-published 1969 monograph, Multiple Protolytic Enzyme Therapy of Cancer, Dr. Shively reported on 192 cases of patients diagnosed with advanced cancer treated with injectable enzymes. 
However, in this was advanced cancer. This isn't just somebody walking in with a little lump in her breast. This was advanced cancer. However, in 1966, the Food and Drug Administration, perhaps in response to Shively's growing reputation, forbade the sale of injectable pancreatic enzymes. So since 1966, the FDA says no more injection of pancreatic enzymes. Yeah, that's just stunning. I mean, I'm telling you, that's why we started The Forbidden Doctor. Well, about the time Shively was doing this, the famous pancreatic cancer doctor who really resurrected Dr. Beard's work, uh, William Donald Kelly, and it's his book, An Answer to Cancer, you can mm-hmm. get that online, uh, started his work and his research even before he found out about Dr. Beard. He wasn't trying to resurrect Dr. Beard's work. He was a, a very successful orthodontist in Grapevine, Texas, Back in the early 60s, and he was still in his mid-30s, and he became devastatingly ill. He had created methods of um, orthodontic procedure that is still used to this day. Yeah. And because of that, he became... He was an inventor like Dr. Dr. Royal Lee. Right. He didn't practice dentistry that much once he got a hold of what was going on here. But his, his doctors diagnosed him with advanced pancreatic cancer. Which, so so he, he was motivated... Very motivated. To find a cure quickly. Because he had four kids who depended on him, and with all his other patients, uh, or, or the people who were responding to his orthodontia protocols, he, he needed to do something in a hurry. Well, and he kind of found, discovered this accidentally, because he had such gastric distress that he added in high doses of oral pancreatic enzymes. Oral, not injectable. Not injectable, but he didn't even know about this stuff no. yet. He just had digestive issues, so... He added high, high doses. I know multizyme. He took like 40 multizyme a day yes. along with the pancreatic enzymes. Yes. And literally he would see his tumors go down on his stomach. Yeah, they would shrink. The tumors yeah. that were sticking out of his belly, not sticking out, but, you know, causing bulges. He said he could fill them. Yeah, you could palpate them through the abdominal yeah. wall. Began to shrink. Yeah. So he did that before he found Dr. Beard or anything else. And... Then um, he research, his research eventually led him to Dr. Beard's book and papers from 50 years earlier. Yeah, 50 years. I mean, you think in 1969, the FDA came in and stopped pancreatic. Just imagine what Dr. Kelly w- was going through his head. Imagine when he found the system by trial and error that helped himself and, and other people he started to work with, and suddenly he finds Dr. Beard's work that this had already been discovered 50 years earlier, so sad. but silenced. So sad. So um, by the late 1960s, having long abandoned dentistry, he, since this worked so well for him, he refocused his attention on treating cancer with his nutritional regimen. What happened next was, this is kind of where Dr. Gonzalez starts to show up on the scene, because Dr. Gonzalez uh, trained at Sloan Kettering, an MD from a Cornell Medical School, and under the direction of Dr. Good, who was the president of, Cor- of uh, Sloan Kettering, um, during his second year of med school, Dr. Gonzalez, uh, found out about Dr. Kelly, went down to Texas in the, uh, I think, the summer of about 1981, and began to study Dr. Kelly's work and Dr. Kelly's, you know, extraordinary uh, results, his methods, his successes, and his failures, of course. He wanted to find out why his system didn't work on some people, which is what I was alluding to at the beginning of this podcast. he did find out. But, you know, but there were the people who were diagnosed, biopsy proven with advanced, even terminal cancer. Some of these people were alive five, ten years since the beginning of the enzyme therapy. These were terminal cancers, terminal. which were appropriately diagnosed, biopsy proven, very advanced, and terminal. And so one of them we want to bring up here for one of these patients that was a woman who had been running a gas station with her husband in Wisconsin. She was diagnosed in August of 1982 with metastatic adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, which is one of the worst form. Uh, I mean, it just wants to spread everywhere. And when they did biopsies, they found out that it had already metastasized to her liver. And the Mayo Clinic, uh, in fact, had even confirmed that diagnosis. There was no treatment that they could offer. They said, well, you might live 12 months. It's kind of go home and get your papers in order. And when Dr. Gonzalez found out about her from Dr. Kelly's notes, he finally got a hold of her in 1986. This is four years later, four years after her diagnosis. 
And she had still following Dr. Kelly's um, nutritional regimen at that time, feeling quite well, she reported. And in many years thereafter, Dr. Gonzalez continued to keep in touch with her. And uh, uh, reporting in 2014, one of the times he got in touch with her, 32 years after her original diagnosis. She reported she's alive, well, and feisty as ever. Feisty as ever. Oh, is it feisty? Yes, and so Dr. Right. Gonzalez says he searched the literature repeatedly. He says he knows of no other similar patient with biopsy proven. Now, that's, this is important. Biopsy proven liver metastasis from pan- pancreatic adenocarcinoma ever documented by a major institution that was still alive and well 32 years later. And another patient who was initially diagnosed with adenocarcinoma of the uterus in 1969 And because of the large size of the tumor, her doctors advise a course of intensive radiation therapy before a hysterectomy. Because her doctors thought the disease was localized postoperatively, no adjuvant therapy was suggested. So they thought they got it all. Yes. Okay? That's a very common statement. Yep, we got it all. We got it all. We hear that all the time. However, by 1974, her... Five years later. Five years later, which is very... Very common, common, five years for something to show up again. Yeah, her health started to deteriorate significantly, and she experienced unrelenting fatigue, severe depression, weight loss, and vague abdominal pains. Initially, her, visi- her physicians attributed her symptoms to nerves. I just hate yes. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she needs a hysterectomy. She's hysterical. So, um, But when she developed a grapefruit-sized tumor in her pelvis... She was referred back to her surgeon. At that time, it revealed multiple tumors in both lungs consistent with metastatic disease. So her surgeon recommend palliative resection of the pelvic tumor. In other words, they said, hmm, let's just take this out. Yeah, because because she's got tumors in her lungs. She's got them. At least make her more comfortable. Let's just take her uterus out. Yeah, and it was was blocking things. I think that's what it's serious. Yeah. I mean, I can understand why they wanted to do that. Yeah. So, he, but, because he even admitted, she says she has an incurable disease. Yeah, but she's very uncomfortable. Let's at least take the tumor-ridden uterus out. Well, after that, they after they did that, they put her on this synthetic progesterone, which they said, well, this might prolong your life a little bit. But then she had all these side, side effects, effects, and so she discontinued the drug about six weeks later with no further options. Uh, for the treatment of cancer. And that's when she began to learn about what Dr. Kelly was doing down in Grapevine, Texas. So under under his care, her, using the same kind of regimen, that uh, using pancreatic enzymes, uh, serious coffee, enema cleansing, uh, vegetable juices, raw foods, what, wherever they yeah. could. Whatever uh, he, he recommended. Whatever he recommended. Uh, she uh, gradually improved, and she stayed away from conventional doctors at this point. But nine years after starting the regimen, which she should have been dead by then, she returned to her former physician because she was having some heart problems. And um, the doctor, of course, as the record says, was just totally astonished she was still alive. And they did a chest X-ray and found total resolution of all of the nodules that had been there the first time this had taken place almost 15 years earlier in 1969 when she was first diagnosed. And so to put that in perspective, and, and she, uh, when Dr. Gonzalez last talked to her, what she was like 95? She, or, was, it, she died in 2009 at age 95. 95, 34 years after her original diagnosis of a deadly cancer. And to put that case in perspective, Dr. Gonzalez said he searched the literature and found... <laughs> found nobody, no records anywhere of anybody who experienced total regression of the disease and survived for another 34 years after the appearance of such extensive metastases. So those were Dr. Kelly's cases. Now, Dr. Gonzalez, when he went to New York with Dr. Isaacs, started implementing himself these same kind of therapies. But interestingly enough, in taking Dr. Kelly's work to New York, and now it was Dr. Gonzalez's work, what they noticed, what they discovered, is something I mentioned there at the very beginning, different metabolic types. Because with Dr. Kelly, his wife got really ill, and he applied his methodology to her, and she just got sicker. And he tried everything he possibly can to change his uh, vegan, raw food, cleansing approach to his wife, and she just got sicker. 
And he remember he said the only thing I haven't tried was raw meat. Bing. Bing, it worked. And he feeds her, I think, raw hamburger or something like I that. I don't know. Raw meat, and suddenly she gets better. And that's when he began to realize there are different metabolic types. She turned around in 24 hours. In 24 hours from just eating raw meat, her health condition turned around. So that's why people who go straight Gerson, some of them do very well, but some of them, it accelerates. And well, those... And those on the other end of the spectrum, the same thing. We take it a little further here at the Forbidden Doctor, even than that. I agree there's metabolic differences, but I think they're transitory in, in many, many people. We think they are. They're, we are so complicated. Our bodies are so complicated that, yes, in general, cleansing with juicing is a good thing, and it does cleanse, but you need to get your gut healed and sealed first because you don't want to force all this cleansing and have these toxins or this cancer, this debris go back into your body. Yeah, as your body's trying to get rid of this through the small yeah. intestine and colon and there's holes in it, it's yeah. going to go right back into I the I think that's what kills a lot of people when they jump on this massive cleansing. Um, and then some people, you know, it makes... I talked to a, a lady that went raw vegan for two or three years just last night and she said, I felt wonderful and I'm sure she did. And you know, when but then you, remember what she said after that. She said, "Then I started to need meat." Yeah. And she says, "I know I need meat." Well, and it, it luckily wasn't a religion for her because, yes. and even even not even a religion. When you feel so good when you cleanse, and then you start dropping because you can't rebuild on that, then you think, "Well, what made me feel better?" Before it was raw food, and so you start cleansing, yes. you start eating it again, and then you think that should be your daily fare. Yeah, and you go, you eat copious amounts of this stuff, and it just doesn't do the job. You start washing yourself away. The idea is to wash away the toxins, but then you start washing yourself away. You so, lose strength, your teeth loosen, yeah. so you I get ha- osteoporosis. I hate. I want to make you the forbidden doctor, and I hate somebody just giving you here's this diet, follow it impeccably. I don't like that. No, I mean, that's and, not how we. And run. that's what doctor. Doctor, you know, Roll. yeah, that, that's what Dr. Um, Kelly did, and that's what Dr. Gonzalez did a lot. Here's the diet. This is for you. We've de- decided what metabolic type you are. You're a carnivore. And you're you're sympathetic dominant, dominant. All these different right. things. When we're a lot of mutts, and we change all the time, depending on the stress that's around us and, and, and the different uh, levels of health of our thyroid and different things. So I really like listening to your body, being kind and gentle to your body, um, not using force, and and eating what you crave. And that's really important. So when you turn into a vegan, because it does make you feel better, have the openness or the awareness or the ability to accept that, you know, there's maybe other things out there that, oh, I would kill for some red meat right now. I would actually kill them. Then follow it. <laughs> follow that desire. So follow that. So we're kind of coming here towards the end of this podcast. We want um, to give you, let's give you a good, at there's least a, a couple. There's, there's a couple more. A couple of, um, of Dr. Gonzalez's success. Yeah, these are, are. But there are books out there. You know, his, his hardback book that has 50, yeah. 50 cases, yeah. not just of cured incurable cancer. But they lived for years there. Decades. 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 So here's one he puts in this article. A woman came to him with a diagnosis of, of aggressive inflammatory breast cancer that had metastasized to her bones while she was receiving chemotherapy. Now, let me say this. Aggressive inflammatory breast cancer is as deadly as pancreatic cancer. The survival rate is very little. Yeah, she had a tumor so large she couldn't she couldn't have surgery. They had to do five weeks of radiation to the breast to shrink the mass. So she went after that. She underwent a mastectomy. Oh, uh, this just kills me. Um, such, such. Uh, anyway, so after the radiation, the tumor was still huge. She began chemotherapy, three different chemotherapies. Cy- cyclophosphamide is and methotrexate together are, are pretty powerful. And then uh, fluorofluoracil, which her doctors told her at that time she was going to be on for the rest of her life because they said at some point this is inevitably going to reoccur. So after two years of treatment, um, a bone scan revealed multiple areas of activity consistent with widespread metastatic disease. Yeah. So That's the point when she consulted Dr. Gonzalez. Dr. Gonzalez, 
a lot of his cases are when they have to be carried across the threshold yeah. of his they office door. They have to still door. be able to eat, though. They have to be able to eat. If they can't eat, he can't take care of them. So she refused any follow-up testing until some 14 years after she had begun treatment with, with Dr. Gonzalez. Um, that's when she went in for a bone scan finally, and it revealed total resolution of her disease. And so he said today... 26 years from her diagnosis of metastatic inflammatory breast disease, she remains alive, well, and cancer-free, still ingesting a fair amount of pancreatic enzymes. Yes. <laughs> Smart yeah. girl. Yeah, well, you know, that's her, that's her insurance policy to make yeah. sure that she doesn't <laughs> have to have this problem again. Yeah, and that's what we, we um, recommend, you know, taking the enzymes just for energy. We, didn't you have a patient the other day that said they have to stop taking the enzymes? Oh, yeah. She, uh, I, uh, the front desk told me that um, so and so called in, and she can't sit still. She doesn't want to take the enzymes. She anymore. has too much energy. Yeah, well, she's in her uh, mid eighties. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I called her back, and I, uh, you know, I said, uh, "Sweetie, what's going on here?" And she says, "Well, I, I've been taking five. You, you recommend four early in the morning, a half hour before a good breakfast." And I said, "Yes." She says, "Well, I've been taking five. And I, I just, it's driving me crazy. I said, what do you mean driving you crazy? Well, I can't settle down. I, I, I'm just all over the place. I, I can't concentrate. And I said, well, I think you're overdosing. Yeah, at least. She can't weigh more than 105, 106 pounds, a very frail mid-80s woman. I said, cut back to one. Yeah. Just take one. One or two. And then let me know in a, another week or so from now, get, let's get back together and let me know how you're doing. But it's, you know... You know what I would have recommended? That what? she just take the enzymes with food. <clears throat> well, I did of, say that. I did okay. say, I did say just take one, but take it with your breakfast when you eat. Don't yeah, take it in because advance. Because then it will help break down the yes. food she's eating versus yeah. scouring the I body. Did, I did say that. Yeah, okay. So the second to last one we're going to talk about is a survivor of stage four lung cancer. And stage four, that's the worst there is. That's, that's, there's not a stage yeah. five. Yeah, he's sixty-two years old. Year old man. It's about your age, so this has got to. But mean he's a something. lot older than I am. I'm only sixty-five. <laughs> <laughs> he's sixty-two. Well, I am. <laughs> he also had a thirty-five-year history of cigarette smoking. <laughs> so you know, even I, though he had quit uh, almost a decade earlier. Yeah. So, um, but still, a routine chest X-ray showed um, a thickening of the. Pleura? Is that how you say the, that? The pleura, both apices, the, the top of the lungs. Okay. The lining was getting thick. Yeah. Um, it was discounted as being significant, but um, two years later, no, one year later, he started experiencing persistent pain in his lower, right lower flank. Yes. And yeah. so he goes in in uh, October of 2009. Uh, I, which he first noticed a bright red blood in his stool. Not a good sign. No, when he consulted with his primary care physician who ordered a CAT scan of the abdomen and pelvis, uh, there were no abnormalities in the abdomen or pelvis, but it did show that there was some pleural effusion. There was some fluid that was collecting between the lungs and the pleural lining. And then when he got a CAT scan in mid-November of '09, which was a month of later, his chest. there's these multiple pulmonary tumors throughout his lungs. And then there were these two really big ones. One was right next to his heart that was putting pressure against his uh, aorta mm -hmm. and part of the left lung. And another one in his back that they thought was what was radiating pain to his right lower flank, which is why they never saw anything there in the CAT scan. So he's, the report said um, the findings are consistent with osteoblastic metastasis within the right posterior lateral eighth rib. Yeah. So and then they found a tumor in the eighth rib, a, yeah. a bony tumor in the eighth rib. Yeah. And that's you know when they come back to you and say, hey, you know, you got osteoblastic metastatic cancer. They you know, basically you, said, "Yeah, you're in trouble. You're you're kind you're, of dead. You are in trouble." They they acknowledged that the treatment he would get at best would only be palliative, yes. not curative. Palliative means we're going to try and help you with the pain, but there's that you have incurable cancer, and there's nothing we can do. And they said he would live maybe six months if you're lucky. Yeah. So at that point, 
uh, this is when the, the the patient goes on this. You know, when they tell you, it's interesting he didn't do it sooner, but now he's on this crash course of self-education about alternative approaches, and he changes his diet, and he gets rid of the junk food, gets rid of the sugars, begins juicing, eating a largely plant-based diet because that's the major word out there. He stops his um, his uh, statin drugs. Which, oh. Stunning. Yeah, that he had been taken for high cholesterol, the Kozar for the uh, hypertension. And so he finally he finds out about Dr. Gonzalez, contacts his office, and, and they agree to take him on as a patient. Here's another one who's in serious trouble, has been told a death sentence. You have about six months. So he, Dr. Gonzalez meets with him, and he finds that, you know, I mean, he's just in some severe, severe trouble. And so he goes on to the program. Dr. Gonzalez adjusts the program to him. Uh, to help him with the terrible pain because he's on Percocet all the time to help him deal with that horrible pain from his back. Bone pain, bone cancer can have some serious oh, pain, so just some terrible pain. And very shortly after he got on to Dr. Gonzalez's program, two months, uh, two, two months. months later, he says, I feel great. My friends think I'm looking great. He's back to vigorous exercise at the gym. And, and he said the terrible bone pain had completely resolved. Yeah. Now that's, that's unheard of. Yeah. That's just unheard of. And what did the what was the program? The the again, uh, cleaning up his diet, large dosages of pancreatic enzymes mm-hmm. that we know will dissolve the tumor, and detoxification because there's an awful lot of toxins build up in him because of the cancer that has to be removed through coffee enemas. Coffee enemas. Why a coffee enema? Because the coffee, uh, raw coffee that's introduced into the rectum triggers parasympathetic reflexes in the rectal veins that immediately trigger the ducts, D-U-C-T-S, in the liver to uh, expand and allow the liver to dump its toxins out. Then again, back through the colon, which is why you're saying heal and seal that gut first before you start doing these things because it can be awfully rough thereafter. So then, you know, he, he describes himself as feeling great. His stamina is great. He's sleeping. He can work a full eight-hour day. Um, his cholesterol has gone to normal, although, you know, we're not worried that much about that. But uh, the, the year after his first visit, uh, during the third week, he started having some back pain in the area of that rib lesion because it needed some more attention. Then he goes back in and gets another CAT scan only to find out that all of the lesions that were in his lungs, all of the tumors in his lungs were completely, totally gone. Wow. And so they just needed to launch another attack against that thing in his rib. And um, later on, as the, as the uh, story begins to unfold, um, here in February of 2011, uh, the doctor's notes to him says, your ultrasound, no abnormal hepatic masses visualized. Your liver is fine. Your lungs are fine. And... Um, 18 months after his diagnosis, he reported excellent energy, stamina, and concentration. Yes. Yeah. And with, with no evidence, it said, with no evidence of his once widely metastatic disease. And when all he should the, have been dead. This is five years later. He should have been dead six months later. Oh, you're, you're jumping ahead five yeah. years. Yeah. I was just saying 18 months later, his, all his pains had remained completely resolved. And he resumed working 10 to 14-hour days without any drop in his energy. This is stage four. My best friend died of lung cancer at 38 years old. Yeah. It's very, very sad. So the last one we're going to talk about just really fast is a lady, a 39-year-old woman with um, Burkett's lymphoma. Oh, this is, this is, you know, when you read her whole story up to the point she meets Dr. Gonzalez, you yeah. wonder how she was alive yeah, at all. Yeah, this is really bad. And this is actually a, a cancer that works well with chemotherapy, but it did not work on her. It did work some, but um, it, they finally said, we're giving up on you. She said her whole family history, um, she has, let's see, she has a family history diagnosed with cancer, her father with prostate cancer, a sister with cervical and skin cancer, a grandfather who died of leukemia, a grandmother who died from colon cancer, and an uncle who died of lung cancer at a young age, a first cousin who died of colon cancer, and another first cousin with metastatic colon cancer. This is crazy. Yes. Yeah. You, 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 you know, you, you, you want to look at an entire familial history here to find out how many, so many related people within one or two generations can have so much and cancer. And you know they did everything medically possible yes. for them to keep them alive. Yes. So she had a large mass, one half 
the size of a football in her lower back. She It was compressing both her main pulmonary artery and aorta and a mass adjacent to the spinal cord, invading her posterior chest wall and thought to be the cause of her back pain. Yeah. So um, I'm sure it was. They also, I want to bring this up too. Uh, the Burkitt's lymphoma is a malignancy associated with Epstein Barr infections. Yes. So I get a lot of patients with Epstein Barr. Well, yeah, and Burkitt's lymphoma is you, it's rare in this country. It's very common in equatorial Africa, but it's rather, rather rare here. Yeah, and then she was also diagnosed with left ovarian mass and then a small bowel um, with meta all consistent with metastatic lymphoma. So with all the history in between where she had gone lot. through all the various medical approaches that didn't, were able, not able to do anything for her, Dr. Gonzalez finally meets her in February of 2009, and he said, and I quote, she appeared emaciated, was so weak she had to lie down on the couch in my office. As I conducted my intake history, her hair had fallen out from the chemotherapy. She reported drenching night sweats, requiring change of bed clothes four or five times nightly, chronic low-grade fevers, headaches, and a persistent neuropathy, which was a side effect, of course, from the chemotherapy. And he says, despite her dire situation, mm. she proceeded with her nutritional therapy with what? Great determination, great dedication, great enthusiasm, and importantly, with full support of her parents. That's just incredible. That's yeah. so important. It's so important. We have so many people fight their family members because it's alternative. Oh, yeah. And we just got off the phone with an authority figure that um, is fighting the therapy of one of our patients. Yes. And it's just exhausting. It, yeah. There's no side effects except for, you know, getting rid of the cancer. Yeah. You know, but within weeks of beginning Dr. Gonzalez's protocol, she reported significant change in her health for the better. She felt strong enough. She had begun riding a bicycle daily and telling him um, that she felt like a million bucks. So six weeks on her nutritional therapy, she showed a significant reduction of approximately 50 percent on a CT scan. Yes, of the previous uh, previous growths. And then a chest X-ray that was in the third week of June 2009, quote, this is from the radiology report, quote, impression, decreased mild residual fullness of the left hilum, which is in in the area we're talking about, and left anterior uh, posterior window region, no acute cardiopulmonary process. No significant. It was gone. Yeah. On uh, or other mass are seen on the X-ray is what yes. it says. Yes. Yeah. So the anorexia, fatigue, night sweats, and weight loss had all resolved within months. And she appeared to be in complete um, remission. And one of the things that she was warned about with aggressive chemotherapy was what? Sterility. Re- sterility, Sterility. Yeah. You know, that you, you haven't had any children, and one of the risks of our putting you on this chemotherapy program would be sterility. Why? Because it's going to kill the ovaries. <laughs> it's going to kill the eggs, excuse me. Yeah. It's not going to kill the ovaries so much as it will kill the eggs in the ovary. So you're going to end up sterile because of this, but it's the only chance you have to save your life. Well, it didn't. Yeah. And, and remarkable she of said all through, things. Throughout her pregnancy, well, she got pregnant, yes. and throughout her pregnancy, she remained vigilant with her therapy and her protocol. She expressed virtually no symptoms, and in late December 2010, gave birth to a very healthy little girl. Yes. And so here's three years, three and a half years later, both patient, now 39 years old, and still on her nutritional um, regimen, and her daughter remain in excellent health. I mean, this, this almost makes you cry. Yeah, she goes from a terminal prognosis, I mean, a terrible predicament for somebody as young as she was, that was so weak that during his session with her initially, she couldn't even sit in the chair. She had to lay down on the couch. Yeah. And so uh, Dr. Gonzalez finishes off his report with this comment, and we have, Mary, you and I have come to understand this. You alluded to this a moment ago. We've seen this many times with our patients. He says this, quote, Over the years, I have come to believe fully that the attitude of the patient and the attitude of caregivers are together the single most important determining factors between a successful outcome and failure. Patients at peace with their situation and grateful for each day, not filled with anxiety, doubt, and fear, always do the best. And supportive family and friends can make a huge difference in terms of the ultimate outcome. 
Okay, and I, I agree with that, and I think that's wonderful, and it's so important. We've seen it over and over in our clinic, especially if they have to fight their family members, saying, you're doing such oh, a stupid thing. And we see this You all should the time. be in there having chemotherapy and radiation and trusting the doctors. But even still, I've seen patients go through cancer therapies who were calm, who did have, I'm talking about medical therapies. Yes. Chemo, radiation, that had the support of their families, and they still died because I had, you know, this is a your body is a low vibration and food always works and food heals food rebuilds you chemotherapy doesn't rebuild you it may work to knock down cancers and then you've got to get in with the therapies i mean excuse me the protocols of supplementation usually a therapeutic dose of supplementation and good food and you've got to the biggest thing you've got to get your gut healthy enough that you can digest the food you're eating so you can heal and rebuild this is very foundational that that is what i don't care how calm and how supportive you are your family is if you don't have a good digestion where you can break down proteins and emulsify fats and a good excretionary pathway to get rid of the dead and dying debris it's not going to work. You have to be able to go very foundational for these things. Now, maybe they don't have such a bad digestion and they do the chemotherapy and it re, you know gets rid of, especially in four different types of cancers, you know, um, testicular cancer, chemotherapy works real well. And um, in, in young men. And leukemia. And um, yeah, and uh, multiple myeloma and lymph and, and lymphoma, can, yeah, seem because they're not they're the soft cancers. So, if you have a good digestion and the chemotherapy works, I mean, I'm happy for you. I, I'm not sitting here saying it doesn't work and you shouldn't do it. I'm I, that's thrilling, but I cannot tell you how this forbidden information just, just let alone coffee enemas, enemas alone, nobody tells you that that's so critical with chemotherapy. So just this little bit of information to get your gut healthy and to rebuild from the inside out can be so life-saving. And it's not just the enzymes uh, that we're talking about here that are responsible for curing cancer. It's a holistic approach, as Mary's saying here, to healing the gut and rebuilding the body. And all the things that we suggest or imply in this podcast, and especially the last one together, you know, if you're currently a cancer patient... All these things should be reviewed by your oncologist before you decide to do anything different than you've been doing up to this point. Yeah. We highly recommend you discuss these things with your oncologist. And hopefully first. they will work with us. They will realize we are just supporting your nutritional needs. And yeah. that's all. We're not treating cancer. No, we're not. We're supporting your patient's nutritional needs. Um, who, who could not like that? I mean, if a, if a doctor is not receptive to that, you've got the wrong doctor. Yeah. If you're, yeah. Now, th- with that having been said, I want to add this, because uh, this, is, this is the longest podcast we've ever done, so a couple more minutes isn't going to make any difference. Um, a lot of uh, traditional cancer doctors do not want you taking supplements because the majority of supplements people take are... Uh, antioxidative. Mm-hmm. They're the synthetic vitamins, synthetic antioxidants, and most chemotherapy chemicals are oxidative. They, it, it's it's a little bit like the weed and seed fertilizer you put on your yard early in the year. It causes rapid growth of the weeds so that they the the leaves outgrow the strength of the roots and they just die. Uh, that's the idea with some of the chemotherapy approaches to cancer cells. They grow so rapidly that they end up dying because they can't, the food supply can't keep up with it. Well, a lot of synthetic supplements actually get in the way of that and interrupt that process. The vitamin C's. Yeah. The ascorbic acid. Synthetic vitamin C, synthetic right. Synthetic ascorbic acid. Most vitamin C is, is made from high fructose corn syrup um, in China. And then it's imported over here as a powder. And it's just terrible stuff in the first place. But, you know, the, the long and short of it here is that anything we've talked about today is not to be taken as therapy for your particular case. You run this stuff past your oncologist before you decide to do anything. But you must realize we're only recommending whole food. No synthetics added. None. That's important no, because the, a lot of, a lot of 
vitamins out there will say they're whole food or natural, but they th- and they are. They have some whole food in them, but they throw in synthetics, those antioxidants. All you got to do is read the label. Yeah, that can can and If there are large dosages of vitamins are present, I'll tell you right now they're synthetic. And that was contradicted with chemotherapy, very much so, and you need to understand that. All right, so that uh, will take care of podcast 100 for the most part, talking about the intelligence inside your body and the ability to deal with these kinds of problems. There are, we want to say this, many alternative approaches to cancer in the world today, and every country, every ethnic group, every natural healing philosophy, of course, has their own unique approach. And they all work to some degree more or less, or they would not exist. We chose the enzyme therapy to talk about in this podcast because it's very rich and extensive doctor-controlled clinical proof throughout Great Britain in the early part of the 20th century and its clinical existence in America during the last 100 years, especially over the last 30 years in the offices of Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez and Dr. Linda Isaacs in New York City. And just remember... Long Life Energy Enzymes are now available on enzymes. These are the enzymes Dr. Beard championed, the trypsin, the chymotrypsin. They're the ones that are in our enzyme product in a very concentrated form. Right, and we need to make, uh, we've already said this I think twice, I'm going to say this a third time. This is not a cure for cancer. This is just a concentrated form of what Dr. Beard talked about. Uh, if you, we want to be clear about that. I mean, while history has demonstrated its effectiveness, do not undertake the use of this product. I repeat, do not undertake the use of this product for a treatment of cancer without the express knowledge and compliance of your treating physician. This does not take the place of your physician's therapies. Yeah, don't use it for a treatment of cancer at no. all. It is a supplement to support your body while you're going through cancer treatments. Or it's a support for your body just for digestive aspects of uh, pancreatic enzymes anyway. Yeah, they're, they're, some of the reviews on Amazon are really wonderful. Yeah, we're go getting, the, 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 they're, I think we're hopefully pick up two or three of them every week now. Yeah, we're hoping that we can um, have our product explained through our patients' Yeah, their experiences, experiences with it, right. Yes. Okay. So the statements made in this webinar about specific products have not been evaluated by the United States Food and Drug Administration and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. All information provided or any information contained on or in any product label or packaging or this webinar is for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for advice from your physician or other healthcare professional. And here's our contact information. Please text us if you have a quick question. If you have a longer question, give us a call, or you can email us at info at forbiddendoctor.com. And we will see you after the first of the year. Have a very Merry Christmas. Podcast 101. And happy holidays to all of you. See you then.